Today, the anchor of America's news headquarters, we'll sit down with Fox News' Melissa Francis. People in the audience can tell when you're being fake. Plus, the Lord's getting ready to do something big. From a college campus, scripture was alive, my faith was renewed, to 240 countries around the world. Even in their faces, there was something changed. Watch the Holy Spirit move throughout the Catholic Church. Fire, fire, fire spreading from east to west. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Congressman Steve Scalise is in critical condition in a Washington hospital. He's going to need more surgeries after the shooting attack on the Republican baseball team yesterday morning. Well, the new law enforcement, or now law enforcement, is trying to find out more about the man who went after the congressional Republicans. Eric Rosales brings us this look at the shooting assault and the heroes who saved lives. Noah Nathan of Alexandria, Virginia, was walking his dog right next to the practice at Simpson Field when shots rang out Wednesday morning. I thought it was fireworks. And then I heard another one, and I was like, okay, this isn't fireworks, and I saw some of the players scurrying around, and so I just got down. The gunfire lasted for several minutes. Nathan hid behind a trash can. You actually had shots come near you. Yeah, they were hitting off the gravel, and you can hear him hitting the fence. And what did you do then? I was just trying to get as flat as I could. In the end, Congressman Steve Scalise was struck in the hip, rushed to the hospital, and underwent surgery. Matt Micah, lobbyist for Tyson Foods, was shot in the chest. Zachary Barth, a staffer, was also hit and is expected to make a full recovery. And a Capitol Police officer, Crystal Greiner, was also struck during the gun battle. Representatives at the ballpark said they are thankful to be alive. I uh, saw the gunman uh, come around the backstop and he had a clear line of fire into the into the dugout. I only saw him for a second or two long enough for me to recognize if I could see him, he could see me. FBI investigators say the shooter, 66-year-old James Hodgkinson from Illinois, died at the hospital after being shot in the chest several times. Records confirm Hodgkinson was highly critical of President Trump and other Republicans on social media. He had been in trouble with the law before. Police received a phone call about him after gunfire was reported near his Bellevue, Illinois home. The FBI told CBN News the 66-year-old was not working and had been living out of his car since March of this year in the Alexandria area. We will continue to have presence as we process a scene here in Alexandria and FBI agents are searching the shooter's home. After the shooting, local pastors showed up quickly to provide prayer and support. You know, we can have differences of opinion on various political topics, but uh, okay. violence should never be a part of that. Meanwhile, both U.S. Capitol and Alexandria Police Top Brass praised the work of officers assigned to protect Scalise as well as the officers responding to the scene. I'm very proud of the officers at APD and the officers from the Capitol Police who uh, stood their ground and did their job. They did a job which saved the lives of many at and around the ballpark. Gordon? Uh, yes, they did. And if they hadn't been there, you wonder the carnage that would have resulted. They certainly saved many lives. Eric, the FBI said the sh shooter stayed in Alexandria, and they want to speak with people who had encounters with him. What are they looking for? Well, the main thing right now is they want to figure out motive. You know, they want to figure out, was this an isolated incident? What set him off? One of my colleagues did speak to the mayor of Alexandria, and she said that she actually met the gunman at the local YMCA. She was known, or he was known, that is, as the man with the computer. She says that he would often shower there, and uh, he basically was, uh, he didn't seem depressed. He was, uh, and he was very well spoken. That's what she said. Well, it certainly looks like we're going to see more security. Um, these are, after all, public ser servants. And they have mm -hmm. to be at public events. Uh, are, are we going to see that? Is are we going to see now security with every member of Congress? Well, you know, I did speak with a number of people on Capitol Hill, a number of the senators and congressmen, and uh, they actually just said no. You know, they don't want it. It's uh, they need to be able to have the public needs to be able to have access to them, and that really sends out the wrong message. A message that these types of criminal acts are in fact winning, and they don't want that. All right. Well, Eric, thank you. Democrats and Republicans came together in Congress after yesterday's shooting attack. 
And House Speaker Paul Ryan made it clear that both parties were standing united. An attack on one of us is an attack on all of us. Partisan politics pause for a day as Capitol Hill united in prayer for those injured in Wednesday's attack. We were sitting ducks. I mean, we had no, we had nothing to fight back with but bats. Congressman Roger Williams told us of efforts to help his wounded aide, Zachary Barth, including Representative Jeff Flake tying a tourniquet around his leg. All the time he was bleeding and we were under fire, he was texting. He was texting, letting people know we were under fire and that we needed help. Senator Rand Paul told CBN News he felt helpless watching Representative Scalise go down as the gunfire continued. People were nearly killed because of someone who got carried away with politics. Paul says had Scalise, as a House leader, not had his Capitol Police security detail with him, it would have been a massacre. Two heroes, man and a woman, they confronted the attacker, returned fire. Both were wounded, both in the hospital, uh, but probably saved the lives of many people. The Democratic baseball team practicing nearby stopped and prayed in the dugout upon hearing the news. That type of emotion swept Capitol Hill as other lawmakers learned of the shooting. Home, Senator Langford uh, told American, CBN American, how he uh, saw various staffers rich, gathered in prayer, or, or and he ended his floor speech praying for those injured and thanking now, God for his now. protection. He says colleagues are now talking about the rise in death threats to lawmakers. Many of my fellow colleagues have faced a lot of personal death threats to them and to their family. Uh, and we see what that really looks like when that actually gets carried out by some individual uh, that moves from just making threats or being a person that's angry to actually carrying that out. Earlier, President Trump called for unity as he spoke to the nation about the shooting. America is praying for all of the victims of this terrible shooting. In the evening, he left the White House to visit Scalise and the wounded officers. Despite the shooting, the congressional baseball game will still go on as scheduled. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Well, with us now from Capitol Hill is our CBN News political correspondent, David Brody. And David, there's a lot of talk that the poison political climate there is at least partly responsible for this attack. Uh, do, do you think this tragedy will somehow change that? Gordon, I don't think so. You know, I, I've been up here now uh, close to 15 years. And, you know, remember Gabby Gifford six years ago, and actually the political climate got worse after that shooting, uh, not better. Uh, I don't really expect anything uh, new to change here, Gordon. And, you know, let's, let's remember, we heard a lot of flowery statements yesterday from Paul Ryan and Nancy Pelosi. When I say flowery, I'm not, I'm not demeaning it at all, but I'm simply saying that that's nice for one day, but what about the other 364 days? And I think that's the concern up here on the Hill. And look, uh, Gordon, I've, I've covered uh, the topics and issues up here for a very long time now, and I can tell you that this really is a battle for our culture. There are conservative Republicans up here, uh, uh, and conservatives overall that are battling for the culture. There are liberals on the other side who want to move our country in a certain direction, and that's the cauldron. Then you bring Donald Trump into the mix, who tells it like it is, throws political correctness out the window, and it's a very volatile uh, poison out there. I, I say poison, a very volatile solution that is obviously turning into what we saw yesterday. Well, this shooter was clearly targeting Republicans. Are they concerned about the threat to their safety? Well, you know, I know I heard Eric mention that in essence, what are they going to do? They got to move on. Uh, and, and that is true. I will say there was a senator, uh, and I, I won't give the name out, uh, but a senator's office told me uh, this morning specifically uh, that they have seen the number of threats to their office go up considerably in the last few months. And there is talk here on Capitol Hill about doing something, but I think that's the key word. What is the something? And there's been even talk about dipping into campaign funds. In other words, they obviously have to change. Change the, the laws up here on Capitol Hill about that, but, but congressmen dipping into their campaign funds to provide security detail for them. So that's one of a myriad of suggestions up here, but nothing with traction so far yet, Gordon. Okay. There's also talk about a concealed carry legislation uh, that would allow them to uh, bear arms within D.C. Will that happen? 
Not much traction on that either. Now there are there is a bill here on that on the House side uh, by uh, Georgia Congressman Barry Loudermilk, uh, who was at the uh, congressional baseball practice yesterday. He has introduced that concealed carry uh, legislation, and basically what they're trying to do with that legislation. And there's been companion legislation on the Senate side as well, which means that if you have a concealed carry permit in the state that you're from, that you would come to D.C. and be allowed to have a concealed carry permit here in D.C. as well. It wouldn't be for all members of Congress, just for those that already have it. Uh, but once again, that's been tried here for years. It hasn't gone anywhere. I don't necessarily expect that to go much further up here as well. Well, let's go back to the poison atmosphere. There's a, a, a report, a leak, that the special counsel may investigate Trump for obstruction of justice. Uh, how do you think the White House will respond? Well, the White House has put themselves in a position where all comments will come from the lawyer uh, in the case, the, the tr Trump's main lawyer. Having said that, there are tr uh, comments always coming from Donald Trump's Twitter feed. And as a matter of fact, uh, this just coming out this morning, I'll read it to you. This is Donald Trump saying, you are witnessing the greatest witch hunt in American political history, led by some very uh, bad and uh, conflicted people. So, uh, look, this is Donald Trump uh, fighting back. That's what he does. Look, I don't think there's any question here uh, that Donald Trump intended to make sure his name was cleared. I, I mean, he'll be the first one to admit that. He wanted his name cleared. The question is, was there intent to obstruct justice? And, of course, that's a much higher bar, and we go into a lot of legal uh, issues. I will say this. The, the lawyers for the Trump White House uh, are basically a bit concerned about the fact that Robert Mueller has an, an since hired a lot of folks in his lawyer team with uh, Democrat ties, whether it be financial or otherwise, and, and that has them uh, uh, a bit up at night. Well, uh, um, I frankly don't think it's going to go anywhere. Alan Dershowitz has already come out to say it's, it's absolutely impossible for the president to obstruct justice at the federal level. The FBI reports to him, the Justice Department reports to him. And in any case, he can always end any investigation by pardoning anyone involved in it. So you do sort of scratch your head from a legal standpoint. Uh, what are they doing? But Mueller clearly has a dream team, and it looks like we're going to be in for a long, long investigation. Many headlines to come. Well, David, thank you. Thank you for your insight. Thanks, Gordon. I do want to remind people that we have an aspiration, and I hope it's more than an aspiration. I hope we can make it real, that we are one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And the current political climate, uh, I believe, has led to this. Uh, you certainly hear the rhetoric uh, calling for all kinds of things and for somebody to actually act on that. It's is shocking to us, but at the same time, it's a byproduct of the, of the climate. So what do we do now? Uh, I think we need to pray. And we're already seeing that on Capitol Hill, Democrats and Republicans coming together to pray. And we need to once again reaffirm we are one nation under God indivisible. We may have our political differences, but it should not divide us as a nation. Terry? Well, coming up, Fox News' Melissa Francis reveals the secret to all the tears she shed when she starred in Little House on the Prairie. I imagined all of my pets dying. I imagined in the wagon that went down the hill that my dog was in there, and my cat, Princess, and my fish, Neptune, was in there, and the bowl shattered, and the water was everywhere, the carnage, it was terrible. I imagined that, and I was sobbing and wailing. Melissa Francis talks about the real life lessons she learned from the prairie when we come back. She's a popular anchor on Fox Business Channel and Fox News. And if Melissa Francis looks familiar, it's because she was a childhood actress on one of the most beloved shows of all time, Little House on the Prairie. Well, she recently sat down with our Wendy Griffith in New York to talk about her life, her faith, and her new book. At only six months old, Melissa Francis landed her first big gig, a Johnson & Johnson baby shampoo commercial. Then at eight came the role of a lifetime on Little House on the Prairie, starring Michael Landon. What was Michael Landon like? He was sort of like Santa Claus 
and, and a godlike figure all rolled into one. He was incredibly fun, but he was also so hardworking, so smart. Um, you know, on the set, he, he was one of the first people to figure out in order to make a mint in television, you had to own the production. He owned it, wrote it, created it, produced it, starred in it, directed it, everything. Melissa played little Cassandra Ingalls, who along with her brother, played by Jason Bateman, were left orphaned when their parents covered wagon careened down a hill. One reason Melissa got the part, she could cry real tears when it mattered. I imagined all of my pets dying. I imagined in the wagon that went down the hill that my dog was in there and my cat princess and my fish Neptune was in there and the bowl shattered and the water was everywhere. The carnage, it was terrible. I imagined that and I was sobbing and wailing. Do you still have it? Um, I, you know what, it's so funny. So I tried it out when I got a ticket recently and I ended up just bursting into laughter. I was like, <laughs> I'm gonna bring out the waterworks. I'm gonna cry to get out of this ticket. It didn't work and I got the ticket. By age 18, Melissa wasn't sure she wanted to make acting her life, so she switched gears completely and headed to Harvard to major in economics with the goal of becoming a television news reporter. But breaking into TV news proved much harder for Melissa than acting. My hands were always shaking. I was so nervous. I wasn't making any money, but I wanted to be in this business so badly that I just trusted that if I kept working hard and kept knocking on those doors that it would work out. Despite Melissa's fierce determination, she was fired from her first on-air job. I just had such nerves, and I would look into the camera, and I always felt like that black abyss just sucked the air out of my body. I could barely speak, so I was trying to get through that process, but I didn't have time before I got fired by a brand new news director who took over the station as the first order of business. She told me I had 30 minutes to pack up my things and get out. And it was devastating. And I went back to my apartment and I um, mostly cried and, and felt sorry for myself. I always say that step one on the road to recovery, wallow in a giant vat of self-pity. <laughs> get it out of your system. Oh God, why me? Melissa went back to TV. And after years on the local news circuit, she got her big break and a chance to work alongside her TV idol, Maria Bartiroma. I saw her and I thought, she is fantastic because she was brilliant, powerful, and beautiful. Right. She showed you you could do all of it. You didn't have to compromise any piece of it. You didn't have to try to look like and act like a man. You could be a feminine woman and still be brilliant and powerful. Melissa loved her time at CNBC until one day she reported that the math on Obamacare didn't add up. And I was called up into the principal's office and told that I was disrespecting the office of the president. And I said, well, wait, no, I'm just doing math. And by the way, I have a degree in economics. And I was told to stop. Soon after, Melissa made the jump to Fox News, where the late Roger Ailes gave her some life-changing advice. He said to me on day one, you be you. We encourage everyone here, you be you. Take risks, go big or go home is a phrase. He didn't use that exact one, but that's what he meant. Um, you know, he said you have to really be authentic, that people in the audience can tell when you're being fake. Not backing down, the White House responding just moments ago to... Today, Melissa's hard work has paid off. She's seen regularly on a number of Fox News shows and co-hosts After the Bell on Fox Business. Along the way, Melissa met and married Ray, and together they have three children. She says her Catholic faith and his Methodist faith turned out to be the perfect combination. We send our kids to Catholic school during the week. We actually go to a Methodist church on Sunday. Perfect. And, you know, we kind of get the best of both worlds. This is a great time in your life. You know, I feel so blessed. And the first thing I do every Sunday is I look around at my family and I thank God profusely for all my many blessings because I know it is not a result of anything I've done. I give all my glory to God. I mean, I, the same way I try not to beat myself up when I make mistakes and instead learn from them and ask forgiveness and move on. And I have finally reached a point in my life where yes, I finally have that peace and yes, joy that I always wanted. And although she's far away from the simple life she lived as a childhood actress on Walnut Grove, Melissa says the lessons she learned on the prairie are still very much with her today. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, New York. And those lessons are shared with us in her latest book, Lessons from the Prairie by Melissa Francis. It's available wherever books are sold and 
<clears throat> Subtitle is The Surprising Secrets to Happiness, Success, and Sometimes Just Survival I Learned on America's Favorite Show. It's a good read. Get a hold of it. Gordon? Well, up next is the golden jubilee of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. The first thing the renewal teaches you is God loves you so much, you have no idea. This connection with the Holy Spirit today, oh, it's real. It's real. It's palpable. The pioneers of this movement trace it back to its beginnings 50 years ago after this. Well, this year, Catholics all over the world are celebrating the golden jubilee of the Catholic charismatic renewal, especially the pioneers of that renewal. As they look back over the last 50 years, they still feel the fire of the Holy Spirit that spread from their small college all the way around the globe. Well, you know, it's really interesting. In all four Gospels, John the Baptist introduces Jesus not only as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, but as the one who will baptize in the Holy Spirit. So being baptized in the Holy Spirit is one of the central things that Jesus does. And thanks be to God, there's a, a growing, growing awareness of that today in the Catholic Church. Pope Francis began Pentecost 2017 celebrations with a prayer and praise vigil at the ancient Circus Maximus in Rome. Thousands of Christians from around the world joined the Pope to mark the 50th Jubilee of the Catholic Charismatic Renewal. The college-aged American pioneers of the renewal are now its elders, and many were in attendance. In their lifetime, the renewal has sparked a new Pentecost among Catholics worldwide. The movement began in 1967, when the gifts of the Holy Spirit were bestowed upon a group of Duquesne University students on retreat at the Ark in the Dove. Kevin and Dorothy Ranahan remember when friends first told them about the Duquesne outpouring. <laughs> My reaction here was pretty negative, and so was Dorothy's. But uh, we knew these people well. I mean, they were solid responsible, renewal-minded Catholics, and they were scholars. I mean, we were all in the intellectual life. We were all uh, students or professors in theology, church history, philosophy. And so we could see that, that even in their faces, there was something changed and different. And so although we wanted to discount what they were saying as sounding a little fringy, we could not deny the experience we saw they had 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 changed them. And whatever it was, I think we came to see we wanted that too. We wanted more. We didn't even know what the more was sometimes, but we wanted more, more of the Lord, more work to do, more empowerment. We felt like a lot of things in the world needed to be changed and that we were the changers. Newly married at the time, Kevin taught theology at St. Mary's College in Indiana. And Dorothy was a Catholic high school teacher. Both earned master's degrees in theology from the University of Notre Dame. After hearing about his colleagues at Duquesne, Kevin embarked on a six-week study of the scriptures and received the baptism in the Holy Spirit at a Bible study among fellow Catholics. This was a personal experience of Jesus standing next to me, which I, I had never had before. And it was very powerful. And it was so changing. I mean, suddenly, even that night, scripture was alive, my faith was renewed, it was filled with joy. Dorothy received the baptism the next day alone in a chapel. It was like the Lord planted a flag in the center of my life and said, this is permanent, hang on to this, you know, and, and it changed everything. The couple sought out the Full Gospel Businessmen's Fellowship, an organization with roots in Pentecostalism, to learn how to use the gifts for ministry. And I can't imagine how he reacted to this phone call. Hi, we're a bunch of Catholics from Notre Dame and we've just been baptized in the Holy Spirit and we would like to find out about the spiritual gifts. Can you help us? After spending some time with the Full Gospel businessmen, the Ranahans began to lead meetings on the Notre Dame campus and witnessed the gifts of the Spirit flowing freely. Well, we had these large prayer meetings, sometimes 400 people every week. They were amazing meetings in that we were all so new to this. So we started praying for everybody if they wanted healing, and quite often we saw healing. 
Just after Easter in 1967, Catholic students from top American universities met at Notre Dame to learn more about the Duquesne outpouring. Ralph Martin, a Notre Dame philosophy graduate, was a campus ministry leader when he brought 40 students from Michigan State to the gathering. They called it the first international Catholic charismatic conference because there was one nun from Canada who came. Later, members of the renewal movement launched ministry enterprises like New Covenant Magazine, which spread news of the outpouring around the country. That summer, several Duquesne University students lived with Lutheran pastor and founding CBN board member, Harold Bradison, in his parish home near New York City to learn street evangelism. It was like discovering in his school, in the Holy Spirit School of Harold Bradison, what it was to walk in God's providence, what it meant to evangelize. And we realized that we had a responsibility not just to preach the gospel, but to how, learn how to do it well and to be effective at it, not just kind of throwing it at people. Back at Notre Dame, Catholic priests, nuns, and lay leaders attended the renewal meetings while on campus for continuing education. When they went home, they took this with them. They went all over the United States, they went to Australia, they went to the Philippines, they went to various countries in Europe. So I can remember one night being in that room and hearing a prophecy that I remember this way, fire, fire, fire spreading from east to west. And it, it went on to talk about what we were experiencing spreading around the world. After the National Catholic Reporter ran newspaper coverage of the outpouring, Pope Paul VI sent Cardinal Sunins of Belgium, one of the four moderators of Vatican II, to evaluate what was happening. The Cardinal met with Ralph Martin and observed various student groups. So all my life, he said, I've been searching for wherever the Holy Spirit's working, trying to understand what's happening. I came here, I see the Holy Spirit's working. I wanna do whatever I can to help you integrate this and open the whole Catholic Church up to it and bring you into the very center of things. Cardinal Sunins invited Ralph Martin and his young family to Belgium to help lead the renewal in Europe. By 1975, 10,000 Catholic charismatics from around the world joined Cardinal Sunins in Rome for Pentecost. Be a sign to the world and show them by the radiance of your face that Christ is risen. Pope Paul VI entered St. Peter's Basilica and addressed the movement as a chance for the church right from the very top, sort of this open door to the Holy Spirit, and it just kind of went on from there. The renewal also birthed new religious orders and increased the number of those called into ministry. In the early 1970s, Father George Montague, a Pauline scholar and professor at St. Mary's University in Texas, received the baptism in the Holy Spirit after a nun who had attended the Notre Dame meetings demonstrated spiritual gifts. Well, here's the New Testament alive right in front of me. <laughs> this is happening with the Holy Spirit it's coming right in, right in front of me. You know, I had been, a, uh, I had been baptized, I had been confirmed. Um, I had made religious vows. I, um, I was ordained as a priest, you know, and so all those things kind of blocked me a little bit because, you know, what more do I need? <laughs> After 25 years of ministry in the renewal, Father Montague, along with Father Bob Hogan, formed Brothers of the Beloved Disciple to serve in San Antonio, Texas. The Holy Spirit empowers our ministry through the spiritual gifts so that God can, people can say, wow, truly God is in your midst. Truly Jesus is reaching out to me. A fruit of their ministry is Maricela Solis, a widowed retired school teacher from San Antonio who spent 30 years away from the church. She says the renewal led her back to Christ. And I was so depressed, and I was so lost, and I was in such darkness that I knew I had to go back to the church. The first thing the renewal teaches you is, God loves you so much, you have no idea. God is your perfect Father. And that was life-changing for me. I finally found a Father. But this connection with the Holy Spirit today, oh, it's real. It's real, it's palpable. Today, more than 120 million Catholics in 240 countries enjoy life in the spirit. In February 2017, Fernando Nascimento traveled from Brazil to the Ark and the Dove for the 50th anniversary of the historic outpouring. Celebrating the golden jubilee of the Catholic charismatic renewal, 
Fernando's entire family came to Christ after a word of knowledge and a prayer of deliverance rescued his alcoholic brother. So they laid hands on my brother and he knew alcoholic and he stand up full of the Holy Spirit, you know? And this was um, a wonderful changing, you know? I saw my brother coming on that evening, shining, really shining. Today, the brothers preach the gospel all over Brazil, and Fernando hosts the Brazilian TV show, Praise the Lord. The Lord Jesus, through this renewal, really touched our family. I don't know where would we be without the Lord Jesus. As the pioneers of the movement recall their history, they anticipate greater Holy Spirit-inspired wonders ahead. From Sister Elena's urgent letters to Pope Leo, to the 1901 outpouring in Kansas, to the Azusa Street Revival, to the Decane Weekend and beyond, all of these events declare the gifts of the Holy Spirit are intended for every generation as the Spirit works to unite all Christians to Christ and to each other in order to reach the world. It's a surprise of the Holy Spirit that's opening up great new possibilities. And we don't know what's next. We have a sense, I know we have a sense here, the Lord's getting ready to do something big. God is always ready to do something big and He's moving today. If you want to know more about the Holy Spirit, and specifically the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We've got two things for you. One is the Manifestations of the Spirit. It's a wonderful booklet, absolutely free. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Uh, we'd be glad to send it to you as a PDF file. Don't have access to computers, we'll mail one to you. Uh, we want you to get this information. What does the Scripture say about how to receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit? What are the manifestations? What are the gifts of the Holy Spirit? It's all yours free. And if you want to have someone lead you in the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we have something special for you. On CBN.com, we have a video teaching from Harold Bradison. He's the, one of the founding directors of CBN. You just saw him in that wonderful piece, his influence on the Catholic charismatic renewal uh, and how pivotal he was in that and pivotal certainly in the history of CBN, the history of my family. Uh, and he's gone on to be with the Lord, but through the power of videotape, uh, you can have him teach you how to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's all available on CBN.com. I have to say, nobody teaches that better than Harold. <laughs> he's, he's Mr. Charismatic. Yeah, he really <laughs> is. That's well worth listening to or watching. Well, coming up later, a pastor with a frightening disorder my face paralyzed from the corner of this eyebrow all the way almost on a diagonal to the bottom corner of my right side of my face. I was unable to speak or control my face. Watch how this man overcomes paralysis through prayer. And welcome back to the 700 Club. Southern Baptists took a stand against racism at their annual meeting this week. They formally passed a resolution that contempt, condemned, quote, every form of racism, including alt-right white supremacy. Southern Baptist leader Russell Moore was a main supporter of the move. If we're a Jesus people, let's stand where Jesus stands. And Jesus says, my house shall be a house for all people. In other news, attorneys representing a high school football coach who lost his job for praying at midfield after games argued his case before a federal appeals court this week. Joe Kennedy was an assistant football coach for the Bremerton School District in Washington State. Attorneys for the school district argued the prayers violated the Constitution because teachers can exert pressure on students, intentional or not, which can result in coercion. Kennedy's attorneys maintained the prayers were a private expression of faith and therefore don't violate the Constitution. You can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Gordon and Terry are back with much more of the 700 Club. It is coming up right after this. I want you to have this wonderful DVD, the In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. 
uh, just today the headlines about um, the Palestinian Authority paying for suicide bombers, paying for terrorist attacks within Israel. You don't understand the roots of that unless you know the story of the Six-Day War, unless you know the story of Israel's history. So I want you to have it. It's yours when you give us a gift of $15 or more. So if you'd like it, call us 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Amu was a mom with two children to feed and a baby on the way. After her husband was sent to jail, Amu became desperate until she got help from CBN's Orphan's Promise. Take a look. Going to grandma's house for dinner had become a regular thing for Amu and her kids. They went because they were starving. My parents have been so supportive. They don't have much, but they share it with us. I know they have lots of bills to pay too. Amu makes crafts to sell at the market. She learned she was pregnant just before her husband was sent to jail on a drug charge. She's under a lot of stress. I do chores and look after my brother to help out. During the last months of her pregnancy, Amu could barely walk to the market and her craft supplies were nearly gone. So CBN's Orphan's Promise helped in two ways. First, we restocked her craft materials for the business. Then when the baby was born, Orphan's Promise covered hospital costs for the delivery, about $200. Finally, we gave Amu some formula and supplies for her newborn. We were in a very difficult season of our life, and Orphan's Promise came just in time for us. Today, the baby is now a toddler and is doing well. Amu's business continues to grow thanks to contracts with local stores. And occasionally, they even invite the grandparents to their house for dinner. We always have food to eat. We used to depend on my grandparents all the time. I'm so glad that now we can help them. Thank you, Orphan's Promise. You have blessed my heart. It's so rewarding to see a family stay together, to see children happily with their parent, to see them all engaging in life with grandparents, food on the table, an opportunity to make a living. You know, you'd be surprised how easy it is to make that happen with a small amount of money. When we all link arms together, we can do it for thousands of people. And we keep families together. We keep culture strong. We want to say thank you for partnering with us in that. You know, we're out to make a change in the lives of vulnerable children. And sometimes it's just an issue of poverty. So 700 Club members, you make a difference in all of that. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. And it's so easy to join. You go to your phone, you call our toll-free number, an easy one to remember, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. Immediately upon joining, you'll be touching the lives of people like Amu and her family. And our way of touching your life and saying thank you is to send you miracles. This is a DVD teaching that Pat has done where he shares biblically about the concept of healing, God's power, the availability of that power, and many stories that will build your faith. We want you to have this, and we say thank you in advance for caring about others. Gordon? Well, up next, a man who was in tremendous pain. I had excruciating pain all up and down my left side. Uh, someone asked me on a scale of 1 to 10, what was it? I said 11. See how he was supernaturally healed after this. Paralysis was creeping up the left side of David Chotka's face. And for a long time, Doctors had no clue what was wrong with him. Then once they did find out, they told him it was too late for treatment. While I was talking to the doctor, my face paralyzed from the corner of this eyebrow all the way almost on a diagonal to the bottom corner of my right side of my face. I was unable to speak or control my face. My eye could not close. A week earlier on Father's Day 2013, Pastor David Chotka began to experience severe pain in his ear. I went to, n to bed that night and I had excruciating pain all up and down my left side. And I began to sweat profusely. I sweat through four pair of pajamas that night. Uh, someone asked me on a scale of one to 10, what was it? I said 11. When David visited a walk-in clinic the next morning, the doctor told him it was an infected mosquito bite 
and prescribed antibiotics. But the following morning, new symptoms appeared. I was shaving, and my wife came into the bathroom, and she noticed there was a red ring underneath my left ear. She came back a minute or two later and noticed that the ring had expanded. Five, six minute increments, it was getting considerably larger. It was quite frightening for us, and he was very ill. And someone over the age of 50 is never supposed to be recovered. His wife Elizabeth drove him to the emergency room, where doctors started a new round of antibiotics. David showed some improvement, but the following Sunday, things took a turn for the worse. I had had a piece of toast. And instead of it tasting like a piece of toast, it tasted like sugar. And that was strange. I thought, something odd is going on here. Something's not right neurologically. And my lip began to paralyze. I couldn't feel it. It was like I had been to the dentist. And I called my wife, and she looked at me, and the paralysis was expanding out across my face on the left side in particular. David was rushed to the hospital where doctors diagnosed him with Ramsey-Hunt syndrome, a severe neurological disorder caused by a shingles outbreak that affects the facial nerves. And he said, you are eight days, and the, uh, the treatment window is usually two or three days when you discover that you have a shingles infection. I had a 40% chance of getting some of my face back. His wife and his church began to pray. Our congregation is about 1,200 people. Many, many, many people of that group were praying, plus our friends from other congregations we've served. David was admitted to the hospital for a round of steroid treatments, though doctors had little hope they would help. While there, he opened up a Bible. I was reading John and John 5, and the, the question of Jesus in John 5 to the man 38 years sick, he says this magnificent statement, you have been made well. And I knew I was talking to the Lord and not just reading a passage. David left the hospital 10 days later with no change in his condition. His doctor recommended he find another vocation. He said, you're probably not going to speak again. And I thought, oh, what a terrible thing. I was sleeping 16 hours a day, unable to get energy. Uh, it was scary, but the strange thing was the solution when I became terrified, every single time that I would say, John 5, 14, you have been made well, the gift of faith would rise inside my soul. I would know I was gonna be well, even though all the evidence said that I wasn't going to be. His church granted him a leave of absence, and friends and family continued to pray. Then this woman, Gail, said, I have prayed for you. And what has come to me is the story of Paul the Apostle when the shipwreck happened at the end of Acts of the Apostles. And they're building a fire, and he picks up a piece of wood to throw it in the fire, and a viper lands on his wrist. And, and he shakes the viper off into the fire. So this woman says, the enemy has taken advantage. You are to shake this off in the same way as the Apostle Paul shook this off. And then when you have become well, the Lord will use this as a platform. The following Sunday, David went to a neighboring church to hear his cousin preach. And a strange thing happened at the back of the church. There was a lady walked in. She got up and she said, the enemy has taken advantage, but you must shake this off. And when you do, the Lord will use this as a platform for the proclamation of the gospel. She said exactly what my friend had said just a few days before, that the small hairs rose on the back of my neck. David began to notice a change. I felt a tingling in the corner of the upper eyebrow. And that night, I was able to move and open and close my eyelid. So I called my wife again, and she came and she saw it, and she said, something's happening. The Lord is beginning the healing. And over the course of that week, all of it came back. When David returned to his doctor, he walked in the door, smiled, and winked. The doctor's reaction was, that's medically impossible. And I said, I know it's medically impossible. And he said, but well, you have Ramsey Hunt. You, you can't do that. And I was going to talk to you about pain management and tinnitus in your ear going deaf. He said, this, this doesn't happen like this. I said, well, I, I believe that the Lord has made me well. Since then, David has shown no signs of illness and is back to ministering full time. Jesus is the healer, and it is very clear in the gospel that he came to heal, he came to love, he came to save, he came to deliver. It's a delight to be the recipient of it, 
as well as to watch other people receive it. And I'm just thankful for the opportunity to testify that it's absolutely true. I love that story. Wonderful how God still performs miracles. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He does not change what he did 2,000 years ago. He is still doing today. You can trust it. Now, how do you get it? I think this story is wonderful because it illustrates how you get it. First, you need to understand faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word. And we've all had the experience of verses that just get quickened. And he had a verse that was just quickened for him. Then he had two witnesses, one who came to him and gave a word. And then he goes to another church and sort of out of the blue gets confirmation word for word. Now, you would expect that that would be instantaneous. And I love instantaneous healings. But I also love the ones that take time. This one took about a week. From that second word, it started, and then over the week, full restoration. Faith comes by hearing. Sometimes we need to pray, Lord, open my ears, open the eyes of my understanding. That was the great prayer of Paul, that, he, that we would understand and know the greatness of his power towards us who believe. You have to start with Hope, you have to start with, do I have an open ear? And then the wonderful thing, when Jesus comes and his presence envelops you and you know that you know that you know that you're healed. Then faith is also an act. And part of that word for David was that he had to shake it off. He, he, we need to do that. God's just looking for something. He's looking for some act to say, yes, uh, I'm shaking this off. Does shaking heal? No. Uh, but acting on the word, acting on faith does something. It's a mystery to me why. But faith is an action that you act out your faith. So whatever you couldn't do before, you start acting like you can because you have received the word. Now, Terry and I are going to pray. And we're going to believe. Faith starts with belief, so let's believe. And let God come to you today. Be expecting an answer, expecting a miracle that he watches over his word to perform it. So let's pray. Let's believe. And the Bible says when two or more agree touching anything, it shall be done. So let's do that in an act of faith. Touch that area of the body, lay hands on it, and we're going to pray and you believe. Lord, we lift the needs of the audience to you right now. And as people are laying hands on that area of the body that needs healing, faith is rising to you. Faith, you always respond to it. You always see it. You are always looking for it. So in faith, we lay hands on that area of the body, we speak to it out loud, be healed now in Jesus' name and be every bit whole. There's someone you're asking, please say rotator cuff. You have a rotator cuff injury in your right shoulder. Uh, it's very painful for you to move. It's painful even for you to rest. God's healing it. He's able to restore it. He's able to knit together tendon and muscle. In Jesus' name, be healed now. And now what you couldn't do before, begin to move that shoulder and realize there's no more pain. And you have free movement all the way around. In Jesus' name, be healed. Terry? Someone else, you've had scoliosis or a form of it since you were young. You're older now, but you have an injury in your back that is, it's like a band that goes across your back sideways, right underneath your armpits. And it's so painful. God is setting you free from that right now. Spine, align yourself and muscles be set free in Jesus name. Um, there's a man you've been having tightness in your chest and God's just restoring you right now. And we're going to, he's just taking fear off of you now. He's able to restore. He's able to heal. 
Uh, no more heart condition, no more problems in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've been healed, give us a call. Let us know. We want to share your good testimony with the world. 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from Jeremiah. For I will restore health to you and heal you of your wounds, says the Lord. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.